Friday night took care of my weekday blues I woke up at breakfast and read the news I'm feeling relaxed, refreshed and renewed But I feel like there's something I'm forgetting to do Hey, uh, Toby, the uh, show's about to start Oh yeah It's a Saturday show It's a Saturday show it's a Saturday show. 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 Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Saturday Show, AADL TV's one and only Saturday morning kids variety show. My name is Toby, and I'm Otto. And today we're talking about buildings and architecture. Toby, that's a pretty big word, architecture. What does it mean? Good question, Otto. When we say architecture, it can mean two different things. Number one, architecture is the process of designing buildings and other physical structures. And number two, the word architecture can also refer to the buildings themselves. Well, what do you call someone who designs buildings? That's a good question, Otto. Someone who designs buildings is called an architect. Hmm, okay. Don't worry, Otto. I'm sure if we jump right in, a lot of your questions will be answered. Okay. So let's get right to it. Kashi and Christopher hit us with the word of the day. Hey, we're all here. How you doing, Kashi? Oh, I'm great, Christopher. How are you? I'm doing great, and Lexi's here too. Hi, Lexi. You know, we're talking about buildings and architecture this week. I love architecture. <laughs> I love building things. I love Legos. I thought that was true. Kashi, do you have a favorite building? Well, I really like the Empire State Building in Ooh, New York City. Fancy. Yeah. What do you like? <laughs> well, I was always a fan of Flaky Howard's Barn on the corner of Sparling and Goodall's Road. Oh. It was nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lexi, I wonder if you've got a favorite thing about architecture and buildings. Oh, I bet she does. Let's find out. Well, let's see what it says. Hmm. It looks like a compound word. Two words together. Keystone. Well, right. Kashi, do you know what a keystone is? Um, not exactly. I feel like it has something to do with an arch. That's right. And here we've got an arch that we're building. And you notice, imagine that these are stones and we're trying to build an arch. Everything keeps falling. So we need a good way to make our arch. And... Let's give it a try. Almost there. Wow, you can make a doorway? That's right. And make it stand up. Oh, oh maybe. Maybe. Make it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, we're almost there. Wow. And one more. So the one in the middle is called the keystone. That's right. And you'll notice that the keystone, <laughs> well, anyway, I, I, thought there for a I think you it get was the, working. <laughs> the right idea. This is the keystone and it's at the top of the arch. Kashi, have you ever heard of the keystone state? Well, yes, I have. It's Pennsylvania. And why do they call it the keystone state? I don't. 
Well, it's a good thing that I looked it up. The Keystone State is called that because it's sort of in the middle of the original 13 colonies. Oh, wow. And also, it played a key role in some of the major documents of the founding of the country. All right. Are you ready for the Summer Game Code? I am. I hope it goes better than our arch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, for the Summer Game Code, it's five letters, and it's a hard one this time. Okay. It's the last name of a historical Ann Arbor family. Mm. Their house is one block away from the downtown branch of the library. Whoa! And their house is now a historical museum that shows life in the 1890s in Ann Arbor. Gosh, that's interesting. It is. And if you think you know the answer, you can go to play.aadl.org for big points. Big points. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you next time. Bye. You should try building that again. <laughs> I will. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Kashi and Christopher. You know, Otto, they were talking about their favorite buildings. Uh, and so I think I'm going to show you my favorite building. What is it? Well, it's something that I remember from my childhood. I have a lot of fond memories, and I remember it being really fascinating. Here, check it out. I'm sure a lot of you have been to a movie theater, but have you ever been to a movie palace? Odds are that you haven't been to a movie palace, but once upon a time, not far from Ann Arbor, Michigan's premier movie palace, the Quo Vadis Entertainment Center, welcomed guests for a movie-going experience like no other. Now, you might ask yourself, what do movie theaters have to do with architecture? Well, if you're used to seeing movie theaters that are large, standalone buildings with no windows, or plopped in the middle of a strip mall, then you're going to be surprised by the architectural wonder that is the Quivatis. In the 1960s, brothers Martin and Charlie Schaefer, owners of several movie theaters and drive-in theaters in the Detroit area, decided they wanted to build their own movie palace. So they hired Japanese-American architect Minoru Yamasaki to design their dream theater located in Westland, Michigan. In 1966, the theater opened to the public and was truly an experience to behold. The outside of the building is considered modernist architecture. Modernism was a way of designing buildings that incorporated new 20th century technologies such as glass and steel. Modernism was different from other architectural styles because it was simpler, less fancy, and didn't have a lot of extra decorations. Looking at the outside of the Quivatis, we can see that the second floor has many large glass windows with golden metal frames that run the length of the building. Very modern. The walls outside the first floor of the building, where people would enter, is made up of thousands of blue and gold stone tiles laid out in a mosaic pattern. The theater sign mimics the building itself. It's gold and blue, and the top of the sign looks a lot like the top of the building. Now, architectural design isn't just about what the building looks like on the outside. The inside of the building is very important too. And what's interesting about the Quivatis is that while the outside is considered modernist, the inside is a Roman style that's about as fancy as you can get. There were fancy couches, chandeliers, a fireplace, recreations of Roman statues, heavy curtains, a fancy dining area, and look at that, that may be the fanciest bathroom I've ever seen. All of this was designed to give moviegoers a sense of luxury. The Quivatis operated from 1966 until 2002. The last three films shown there were Harry Potter, Ali, and Vanilla Sky. And after preservation efforts failed, the theater was torn down in 2011. Charlie Schaefer, who is one of the original owners of the building, still operates the Ford Wyoming Drive-In Theater, 
one of the few drive-in theaters left in the state. And architect Minoru Yamasaki went on to have an amazing career. He designed the Irwin Library at Butler University in Indianapolis. Those windows look a lot like the Quivadas. The Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles, California. And the World Trade Center, formerly located in New York City. While sadly we can no longer visit the Quivadas, the building is preserved in the memories of many moviegoers as well as here in this video. The Quivadas, a unique example of 20th century architecture and leisure. Okay, Toby, I think I'm getting the hang of this architecture and building thing. What else have you got for me? Well, why don't we take a look at some of the segments that we've got on today's show, and I'll find something for you and I to do. Okay. Hi there. I want to show you a really great book about architecture. It's called Iggy Peck Architect. It's by Andrea Beatty, and it's illustrated by David Roberts. And in it, it's about this boy, Iggy, who's a little boy. He loves architecture, and he really wants to grow up to be an architect, but his teacher does not think that that is a good idea. You'll find out why she doesn't in the book. It's really fun. The illustrations are great. It's funny. It's smart. I'll read you one little bit. So here is Iggy Peck. Young Iggy Peck is an architect and has been since he was two, when he built a great tower in only an hour with nothing but diapers and glue. Good gracious, Ignatius, his mother exclaimed. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. But her smile faded fast as a light wind blew past, and she realized those diapers weren't clean. Yuck! He built an architectural building out of dirty diapers. Well, then, as he gets older, he finds better things to build with. When disaster strikes on a class trip, will Iggy be able to use his architectural skills? to come to save the day? You'll have to find out by reading the book. And if you like this book, the same team has three other picture books, Ada Twist, Scientist, Rosie Revere Engineer, and Sophia Valdez, Future Prez. And they even also have chapter books called The Questionnaires. And look, there's Iggy. All right, I hope you'll check out Iggy Peck Architect. What is it? Well, it could fit in my hand. It's got, it's made of metal. It has these little measurement inscriptions in the side here. I can open it and close it like so. It's got a pencil and the other side has a very sharp point. Hmm. What is it? Hey, Kashi, how you doing? I'm great. Do you know where we are today? Yeah, we're at Cobblestone Farm in Ann Arbor. Right. And you know, we're looking at these beautiful cobblestone walls on this old farmhouse. It's really beautiful. Yes, it is. Do you know how cobblestones are made? Well, I think that they are, you find them in the fields when you're trying to make farmland, and they're rocks. That's right. They're all kind of fist-sized rocks, and they were probably deposited here from a glacier. Wow! Most of the cobblestone buildings in the U.S. are right around Rochester, New York. Wow! And farmers used to find the cobblestones in their fields, or sometimes builders would go out to the lake shore and grab these cobblestones to make walls. Wow! You know, one of the earliest, or rather the oldest buildings in Ann Arbor is attached to this farmhouse. Really? That's right. It's from the 1820s. So this whole farmhouse has a lot of special history attached to it. 
This looks like it took a lot of work to build. <laughs> I'm sure it did. It was made by a mason who brought this technology from New York. But and it's over a hundred years old? That's right. This building was made in, uh, I think, 1848. And Kashi, I don't know if you noticed this beautiful herringbone pattern in all the uh, all the rows of the wall. Oh, I see. They're all facing sideways one way and then sideways <laughs> the other way. That, that's right. It really makes the wall beautiful. Well, thanks, thanks for bringing me here today, Christopher. Oh, sure. It's one of my favorite places. Bye. Bye. All right, Otto, while we take a break from segments, I'm going to show everyone what our craft is today. Today, we're going to be learning how to make a scale model of a building, a person, or almost anything else. A scale model? Like, to weigh yourself? No, nope, Otto, a scale model is a model of something that's smaller than the original by a specific amount. So for example, if we made a scale model of the Quavatus at one quarter scale, it would be exactly one quarter as small as the original. But Toby, that still seems like it's pretty big. That's true, bud. So we're going to use an even smaller scale. And it's really simple to remember. Every foot in real life equals one inch on the model. So, for example, if we were going to make a scale model of myself, first I'd need to know how tall I am. Well, Toby, do you know how tall you are? I do, but I'm about six feet tall. So if I was going to make a scale model of myself using the scale one foot equals one inch, how many inches tall would my model be? Hmm. It would be six inches tall. And Otto, how tall are you? I am exactly one foot tall. So if we were going to make a scale model of you using the one foot equals one inch scale, how tall would your model be? I would be one inch tall. <laughs> Could you imagine that, Toby? If I was only one inch tall, that'd be pretty funny. Yeah, it'd be pretty funny, man. It'd be pretty hard to find you, too. So, Otto, for our project, we're going to start with something easy. You and I are going to go outside and use a tape measure to measure how big the garage is. Then we're going to come back in here and put our model together to show everybody. How does that sound? Sounds great! Hi guys, it's Allison here. One of my favorite spots in Ann Arbor is Dickon Elementary, where I went to school from kindergarten to fifth grade. This is what it looked like when I went there. That's me and my little brothers on my first day of second grade. When I was in fifth grade, my class donated the dolphin mural that still hangs outside the media center. I made the dolphin that looks more like a whale. <laughs> A lot of things have changed and evolved since then. Many schools in Ann Arbor have come and gone, but the history of Dickon Elementary remains one of my favorite stories. So let's dive in. This is the Dold School, a one-room schoolhouse with a history dating back to about 1850. One or two-room schoolhouses were the most common form of schools before World War II especially in rural areas. This photo was taken in 1957, which was the last year that these students attended the Dold School, as the new Dickon Elementary building opened the following year. Two other one- or two-room schoolhouses were closed so that their students could attend Dickon, including the Mills and Knight schools. In the mid-1950s, it was decided that Ann Arbor would build three new elementary schools, which would cost nearly $2.5 million and house up to 1,500 students. Those three schools became Wines, Dickin, and Pattengill. The schools were designed by Charles W. Lane and Associates, an Ann Arbor architectural firm led by Charles Lane himself. He and his team of architects, designers, and other skilled personnel worked together to design the schools, 
which included many hours of study, creating hundreds of freehand drawings of concept designs, making three-dimensional mock-ups of the schools, and holding meetings with staff, school officials, and the Citizens Advisory Committee. Construction on the buildings was hard work. First, the foundation had to be constructed, which is shown here for the new Pattengill School. Then, the steel framework needed to be erected. This photo shows one-fourth of the steel framework for the Wines Elementary building. At this point in time, footings for the schools, underground work, and steelwork had already taken place, all within the first six months after Charles Lane was awarded a contract to draw up plans for the schools. And this photo shows Dickon getting bricked up. At this point, the school was about 35% complete. Construction continued on all three buildings until at last the buildings were complete. Finally, in 1957, Dickon, Wines, and Pattengill Elementary opened. This is what the first day of registration looked like at Wines. Dickon Elementary was named after Carrie L. Dickon, who was a teacher at Ann Arbor Public Schools for 40 years. She first began teaching at Ba Elementary in 1894 and worked with a building committee of the Board of Education to plan the new Perry School on Packard Street, which opened in 1902. Carrie Dickin was principal of the school until her retirement in 1934. In 1913, Carrie Dickin established a night school designed to teach the English language and American customs and traditions to people who were not American citizens. Hundreds of people attended the night school, and the program was widely copied and of great importance during the First World War. She received the American Legion Citizenship Citation for her work. Otto Hazley, who was superintendent of the schools, stated, Socially minded and possessing a deep personal interest in and sympathy for those who came under her supervision, she was a true friend and a wise counselor, a skillful teacher, a prominent member of the parent-teacher movement, the organizer of Perry Night School, a friend of the people, a forceful and powerful personality. Miss Dickin was truly one of Ann Arbor's outstanding citizens. Carrie Dickin saw that a school could be even more than a place for children to learn that it could be a center for the community and a place of continuing education for all. Over the years, it has taken many different people and a lot of hard work to keep the buildings in working order. One of my favorite stories about Dickin is the story of Clifford Bryant, who was a custodian with a 25-year career at Ann Arbor Public Schools. He was one of the first two black employees in the system when he began his career in 1946 and the last 11 years of his career were spent at Dickin. Clifford Bryan had a reputation not only for keeping Dickin exceptionally clean, but for being a great friend and helper to the students and teachers. He had an active interest in the school and the welfare of its students. He once said, I try to encourage kids who feel lost. Once, when I was at the high school, I noticed a kid who had a terrible temper. He was going nowhere. If his locker wouldn't open easily, he'd get upset and throw the lock down the hall. I got some other kids to get him involved in sports so that he could feel like he belonged. He couldn't play, but he calmed down and eventually earned his letter as an assistant manager. Today, that boy has a family and works as a plasterer, following in his father's footsteps. When Clifford Bryant retired, a dinner was held in his honor and in addition to personal congratulations from teachers, parents, students, and friends, he also received a watch and gift certificate. Congressman Marvin L. Esch sent Bryant a flag and a note of congratulations. And two years after his retirement, it was decided that the newest elementary school in town would bear his name, Bryant Community Elementary. After his retirement, Clifford Bryant continued to visit the Bryant School and talk to the kids, proving his dedication to the well-being and care of students. All of this just goes to show how special Dickon Elementary truly is, as well as all of the other schools mentioned today. 
All of the Ann Arbor Public Schools have their own unique history and amazing stories to tell. Maybe the next time you enter your school, you'll have a new appreciation for the hard work and dedication of those who came before us. Let's take a look at some drawings of buildings in Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor Now and Then, a book of personal drawings by Milt Chemnitz, was published in 1972. Take a look, you might recognize some of these buildings. Milton Chemnitz was born in Detroit in 1911. He graduated from the University of Michigan, spent time working as a social worker, and later as an activist, helping battle social issues and civil rights. He lived in Washington, D.C. and New York, and spent time in Europe during World War II. In 1947, he moved his family to Ann Arbor to try to make a living as an artist. He then focused on drawing buildings, old homes, and street scenes around Ann Arbor and U of M, which is what you've been looking at now. He liked to draw buildings that he thought should be preserved. His work became well known and ended up on calendars, greeting cards, and several covers of the Ann Arbor Observer. After his wife died, Milt Chemnitz moved back to New York where he lived with his son until his death in the year 2000 at the age of 93. What a life! Hey, take a notebook and pen with you the next time you're on a walk and draw a really great building that you hope will be around forever. It's a compass. No, it won't tell you north, south, east, west. It's a technical drawing instrument that can be used in drawing circles and arcs, just like so. It is used in mathematics, drafting, and navigation when measuring distances on maps. It's a compass. Okay, folks, so Otto and I went outside and measured the garage. We wrote down our measurements, and now we're ready to get started. For this project, we're using an old piece of cardboard. You guys might have a box laying around. You can use cardstock or something like that. I have my tape measure here. I have scissors a pen to mark with, and you're gonna need some sort of adhesive, like glue, hot glue, uh, glue stick. I'm using tape today. So we're gonna get started on this. Okay, Toby, I'll read you the measurements. The wall is 10 feet long and eight feet high. And since the garage is a big square, the measurements are the same on all sides. So you're going to have to cut four pieces that are 10 inches long and nine inches high. All right, so we worked on the model of uh, the garage and it's, here it is right here. It's not perfect, it's not complete, but I think this is a great project for anyone who likes to build. And you can use the same scaling technique to build things out of Lego or clay or pretty much anything else you can think of. Yeah, this is a great project, Toby. I think I'm going to use this technique to design my dream home. I think that's a great idea, Otto. Well, that's all we have for you today, folks. Thanks for watching. 
If you enjoyed the episode and would like more resources, you can head over to aadl.org slash the Saturday show. And if you build something like this on your own, feel free to send us some pictures. You can hit the TSS mailbag by emailing tss at aadl.org. And until next time, keep building. Bye.